live from Austin, Texas. It's the Cube, covering KubeCon and Cloud Native Con 2017. Brought to you by Red Hat, the Linux Foundation, and the Cube's ecosystem partners. Welcome back, everyone. Live here, this is the Cube's exclusive coverage, live in Austin, Texas, for Cloud Native Con and CubeCon with the Linux Foundation. I'm John Furrier, the founder, SiliconANGLE Media, my co-host. Stu Miniman, and next is Joe Bida, who's the co-founder, co-founder and CTO of Heptio, uh, with Craig McLucky, uh, the famous startup that came out of the Google team, um, really one of the principal founders of Kubernetes, with Craig and the team, Brendan Burns and, and the likes. Uh, great to have you on theCUBE, thanks for coming on. Well, thank you very much for having me, it's exciting. Good time, first time on theCUBE, glad to have you. We've been trying to get your perspective because obviously we're fans of the Kubernetes, uh, I just had Lou Tucker on, we were talking inter-clouding and this orchestration opportunity. You guys had that vision, and it's really important to tell the story or at the beginning <laughs> with Kubernetes. You guys are sitting around, having a little beer, free food in the Google cafeteria. <laughs> I mean, what was it like? What happened? How did it all come together? All right, well, uh, I, you know, it's, uh, I started at, at Google, you know, probably 10, 12 years ago, did a whole bunch of stuff, eventually landed doing cloud. And uh, Craig and I started up uh, Google uh, Compute Engine, VM as a service. And the odd thing to recognize is that nobody who had been at Google for a long time thought that there was anything to this VM stuff, right? Because Google had been on containers for so long, that was their mindset, Borg was the way that stuff was actually deployed. So, you know, my boss at the time, who's, who's, who's now at Cloudera, booted up a VM for the first time, and anybody in the outside world would be like, hey, that's really cool, and his response was like, well, now what? Right, you're sitting at a prompt, like that's not super interesting, how do I run my app, right? <laughs> Which is, that's what everybody's been struggling with, with cloud, is not how do I get a VM up, how do I actually run my code? And as Google got more and more serious about cloud, the, you know, every big company wants to dog food their products. And so how do we make the experience that, inside, that folks inside of Google have, developers inside of Google have, match the experience that the cloud customers have? And so the choice there was, either we make everybody inside of Google start using VMs, which would have felt like that step backwards, or we teach the rest of the world about Borg. Now around the same time, Docker started getting a lot of attention, and we we're like, hey, those guys are onto something. They really found a good way to make this technology accessible to users sort of on a single node level. But our experience at Google really taught us that, that cluster view, how do you actually create this sort of abstraction that a whole bunch of computers are one thing that you operate with, that was the thing that was going to be interesting. And so out of that, we, we decided Kubernetes was going to be the thing, or at least getting Borg out to the rest of the world, and we knew for it to be effective, it couldn't just be Google doing it alone, we had to do it in a way that would bring the rest of the industry with us. And so that's really the motivation behind Kubernetes. It took us about another three months to convince all the folks at Google that this was a good idea. It was controversial. Uh, the open source projects at the time were things like, well, the biggest things would be like Chrome and Android. Uh, those things were, you know, the relationship with their community was very different from what we were aiming for with Kubernetes. Uh, they were much more consumer focused versus yeah. infrastructure focused. Uh, and it was early too for yeah. Google to recognize the multi-cloud world. I think you know, some of it wasn't so much as multi-cloud as much as, as developers have a, a really strong sense of where the lock-in is, where the vendor lock-in is, and we knew that if we wanted to win the hearts and minds of engineers and developers and folks that took this stuff seriously, we, you know, as the underdog in the cloud world at the time, you had to really sort of go out there and, and, and build something that was going to be widely applicable, right? Because you don't want to invest your time and energy into something that's super specialized to, to one cloud. And I think, so the whole multi-cloud thing, Honestly, I think it's, it's engineers and developers and, and operations folks that had that sense from the get-go. I think we were just yeah. reacting to that. That's good instincts, too. Kubernetes certainly working out today, state of the union, Kubernetes still only th less than three years old <laughs> as a community. Seems like 20, but the momentum's been amazing. Has been a lot of revisions. A lot of people have their own versions of Kubernetes, yet there's a core vanilla kind of Kubernetes, but it's working. I mean, people have gotten around this. What is the big thing that surprised you the most and where are you most excited right now where Kubernetes is at? Okay, so surprise, I mean, there's 4,100 people here at KubeCon, that's absolutely insane. Um, I think we had this idea that it could be a thing, and the, but I don't think any of us imagined that within three years we'd be sitting here doing this type of thing. Uh, so that I think for me is the most surprising. I think, you know, that 
and it's a challenge to take these ideas that have been in successful, successful inside of Google and translate those to the, to the rest of the world. And it wasn't an easy or obvious thing, right? Yeah. There was a lot of good ideas, but figuring out how to get those out there. And I think that really is due to the larger community. I mean, folks like the, you know, Clayton Coleman from Red Hat coming in early with uh, uh, a lot of that, really brought a lot of that sort of outside DNA necessary to bridge that gap. Uh, so, surprising that we got here, but really it took the community to, to, yeah. to make that happen. In terms of what I'm most excited about right now, uh, I think with the announcement of you know, EKS from Amazon, it definitely feels like we're moving into a new phase of Kubernetes, where folks are being much more focused on, on what do you do with Kubernetes versus how do you get Kubernetes running. And uh, Kelsey tweeted it the other day, other day, but I think we've been saying it for a while, uh, Kubernetes at its heart is a platform for building platforms. And really, we, we viewed it from the start as a toolbox. And I think we're only now starting to see what are the things uh, are people going to be building with that toolbox. And I think that's going to be, that larger ecosystem is going to be much larger than Kubernetes itself. Yeah. Joe, coming into the show, there, there were so many announcements around <laughs> Kubernetes. Uh, there's like 42 you know, certified different versions out there. Um, I think you can help ex explain a little bit because uh, there's you know, the big cloud guys, there's, you, you mentioned Clayton who we had on the program earlier from Red Hat, there's all these companies that are like, oh well, Kubernetes is just like, it's a piece and it's, it's in there. Your company is around <laughs> Kubernetes, so what does this mean that kind of you know, Kubernetes is, I guess we'd say commoditized across there, I think it's a good thing for the industry, but what does it mean, you know, why is there a need for Heptio and what do you guys see as your role in, well, in the ecosystem? Yeah, I think, I think um, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a bunch of folks that are really concentrating on how do I get Kubernetes up and running, and that's one thing. Uh, and I think that landscape is going to be changing and evolving over time. Uh, you know, we're definitely happy to help folks you know, be successful with Kubernetes. It's one of those things we're going to do. We're doing open source project services and forward training with that. Uh, but when we look forward, I think a big part of it is how do we bridge the gap to integrate Kubernetes into businesses? How do we start building those next layer tools on top of it? And to some degree, it's a wild west, right? There's those 42 companies, everybody's trying to actually find something that's going to be interesting, start solving problems. But the thing that's, that's really encouraging to me is that there's, you know, Kubernetes is the base and we're doing work, both Heptio and the community around conformance to make sure that, that we actually have a solid base that folks can build on top of. Uh, and, then, um, and then everybody is focused on how can we actually capture the attention of developers? How can we actually deliver value there? And so that's a really great dynamic when everybody's like, I want to do something really great that people are going to get a lot out of. Um, only good things are going to come from that. Yeah, and, and I liked, uh, you know, th there was a concern some people have. Up oh, last week, AWS is now all in. <laughs> They've got EKS, but you had an announcement about the Hefty Authenticator, open source authentication, a uh, little bit of a partnership with AWS. It looked like even there. Maybe explain. You know, it sounds like one of the things you're building on top of this. Yeah, exactly. I, um, you know, like everybody else, we'd heard all the rumors about, hey, is Amazon going to do a, a Kubernetes offering or not? In our mind, there were, there didn't, were two ways. Didn't they have to, Joe? <laughs> well, that's what I thought last year, but who knows, right? Yeah. I think, you know, um, uh, Amazon doesn't have to do anything. <laughs> um, but when we first started Kubernetes, we reached out to the, to the folks at Amazon, including Deepak, and we're like, hey, you guys are welcome, come join us here. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll join you when the customers are asking for it. Well, it turns out the customers were asking for it, and so here they are, and I think it's actually a great thing, it really is. Uh, now, I think it could have gone two ways. They could have, have built in a bunch of integrations into Kubernetes that were only available through EKS, that, that really made EKS a sort of more integrated, better Kubernetes than running open source Kubernetes on top of Amazon. Or they could have worked with the community with Upstream to try and make Kubernetes run great on, e on Amazon, you know, better on Amazon as is, but then run even better when you're running it with EKS and they actually add the management on top of it. And I think they decided to go that second route, which is much more community friendly. And a couple weeks before the announcement, they reached out to us, said, hey, we noticed you had this project, it looks really interesting, we need a way to bridge uh, uh, IAM to authenticate to Kubernetes, uh, and we like the approach that you're taking, can we work together to continue to develop this? And that was the first signal to us that they wanted to really reach out and work with the community, and so we're like, hey, that sounds great, let's work together and get that stuff out there. Uh, it's still 
very early. I think EKS is you know, GA next year. Um, they set an aggressive goal for themselves, and so I'm really looking forward to see to see where they take that, and we're going to partner with them where it makes sense around things like Authenticator. You mentioned we're going to a whole other level with Kubernetes around the, uh, Amazon's announcement kind of, kind of goes to the next level. You also mentioned you worked at Google Compute App, all these other coolness on Google, and you got Heptio, you solve and making interesting things happen with Kubernetes. And you got a new class of developers coming in that have never heard of what a local director is. So infrastructure as code is happening, so you got the <laughs> cloud game going on. So I got to ask you, as Kubernetes starts to continue to take shape, um, a lot of people are trying to survive, right? I mean, and there's technical architecture decisions, it's almost a tech chess game. Which side of history will you be on kind of thing going on? Uh, and customers want more clarity. So you have a lot of movement and customers want clarity. So how do you see it continuing and what is the right path in your mind? Because, you know, it's looking good right now and commoditization, as some say, I think is a good thing because value is this value in interoperability, there's value in orchestration, there's value in um, a new class of web developer creating, solving problems with code, whether it's societal problems or, or other things. So there's a lot of big picture, holistic things happening. Yeah. And Kubernetes is kind of strikes the heart <laughs> of that. Yeah. What's the right path in your mind? What's the vision you, sh you think Kubernetes should go into? Well, I think, first of all, I think change happens in the industry both fast and slow, right? Um, it feels like, you know, it's been three years since Kubernetes uh, uh, since we open source Kubernetes, uh, and it's come a huge way since then. That happened really fast. You look at enterprise, you look at enterprise adoption cycles. Uh, I, I believe last I heard, the mainframe division was a growing profit center for IBM, right? This stuff doesn't go away, and so as we see things like containers and Kubernetes and serverless and cloud, as we th see these things come on the scene, it doesn't necessarily replace stuff, it augments and it adds over time, and so we see the, the mix of where people invest shift, right? So, yeah. so in that way, things, things become established quickly, yeah. but, uh, uh, but old things go away slowly, right? So I don't think it's going to be as, as quick of a shift as, as, as maybe a, it might seem at first. Now, in terms of uh, uh, where the opportunities are moving forward and where we see this developing, the thing that's exciting for me is as we have and this is something early on, talking with Brendan, he got super excited about, is as we provide new abstractions, as we provide a new toolbox, how do people start creating systems and applications that take advantage of that? And I'll give you an example. Um, distributed systems, pre-systems like Kubernetes, were very difficult because not only did you have to do the like, thing that you wanted to do, you had to build all of this plumbing to actually get two things to talk to each other, to find, to secure, all that stuff had to be created from scratch. Um, and those systems were rare and hard to manage and few and far between. Yeah. Now, with things like Kubernetes, there's a whole set of problems that you actually don't have to solve. So the, the, the floor that you need, you know, the, the floor is that much higher for building these systems. So I think we're going to see a shift not just to cloud native, but I also think we're going to see a set of applications that are Kubernetes native. These are applications that assume that Kubernetes is the substrate that they're running on, and they take special advantage of it. And I think we're going to see amazing thing happens when we really democratize the yeah. plumbing for building distributed systems. And that's the key, make that frictionless. So if people want to go Kubernetes native, they yeah. can take advantage. Okay, that's cool, I want to get your thoughts on that. To take that to the next level, as the world of IoT comes down, <laughs> you could almost look at the world now as all IoT. I mean, there's no on-prem and there's no cloud. If you believe this service mesh and unpluggable architectures, you could argue that a data center is a, ne a network point. It's an attached device, it's an internet of things. So, you're going to need policy, the light bulb has a process in it, the <laughs> Wi-Fi has Wi-Fi's everywhere. So, in a way, this is all going to be kind of a grid, if you will. It's almost going to be kind of a mesh. I mean, this is kind of the right direction, don't you think? Is the more services that come online, you just want to connect to them. <laughs> For sure. That's I, the nirvana, right? I mean, yeah, I, I think, I mean, so there's a couple of- the peace pipe here, too much. I, I think there's, there's a bunch of trends that we're seeing happen there. I think with IoT, we see also a move towards edge computing. This idea of we're going to see much more stuff happening in a more distributed manner. Whether that edge happens to be in your house or whether it be, it's in a, a, you know, a, a telecom you know, cabinet or whether it's just sort of mini data centers that are dropped in to you know, parking lots here and there. Um, so that introduces a whole bunch of new problems uh, in terms of how do you manage that stuff at scale. And uh, one of the things that I see is that we're seeing a 
a, a, an interesting overlap between CDN providers and cloud providers. So you have Cloudflare introducing their, their cloud workers, where you can start running actual code in their, in their, their CDN nodes. Uh, and, uh, and that's the culmination of CDN providers over time fighting with each other to provide more and more customization. On the other hand, you have Amazon taking Lambda, finding ways to actually use Lambda and push that out to the edge, even into devices that are doing local machine learning. Right, and so there's this overlap between these two different worlds. And, um, and then also as we move stuff closer out to the clouds, the, the, the political situations that people deal with become that much more complex. Uh, as you start running compute in all these different countries, all of a sudden, you're, you're, you can't necessarily go to one provider to actually deal with all that. So we're moving from this world where when, you, when you're centered around data, which is the traditional cloud, when you want to put it all in one big pile with compute around the edges, that's kind of like the traditional data center. Uh, going with a few large provider makes a ton of sense. As we move towards a much more distributed world, it becomes a more distributed problem both in terms of how do you manage the compute, but how do you manage the relationships and how do you actually understand yeah. what's happening across all that. And I think Kubernetes can be a part of that puzzle I for think sure. It makes it but it's not, the, it's not the end of the answer. There's still a lot of problems to be yeah. solved there. No, no, but you get the first mile post. You can say, hey, yeah. I can start orchestrating workloads and have endpoints that have services that talk to each other. It's a good step, first step. Joe, one, one thing I wanted to ask you, what are the stumbling blocks? What do people need to look out for? Because, you know, most companies out there aren't Google. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, this morning at, at today's keynote, and you can find it online, there's that, that cloud native roadmap, right, that, that Dan was showing. Um, that, is, that is an interesting thing that cuts both ways, right? On the one hand, it shows an enormous amount of innovation. It shows that we are seeing this explosion of interest in this world, and it's really invigorating. That's from sort of a you know a entrepreneur's view and you know and, and a technologist's view. If I'm a customer, that thing's kind of horrifying, right? I, I look at that and I say, wow, I really have to understand all of this stuff to get ahead. Yeah. And so I think the biggest stumbling block is really uh, being able to make sense of all the noise out there. And I think that 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 noise is part and parcel of an active, you know, innovative, chaotic ecosystem but I think it's one of those things that, that makes it that much harder for enterprises and for sort of more you know, uh, mainstream developers to, to adopt. And so, uh, not like, you know, Tim, you know, we've been saying this for a while, for Kubernetes to be successful, we have to make it boring, right? This Tim Hawken, you know, uh, I think is probably, uh, maybe was the first one to say that. Uh, but we not only have to make Kubernetes boring, we have to make that entire stack boring. We have to make cloud native boring. That's when we'll, it will have succeeded. Um, I don't know what this conference will look like when cloud native is boring, but it'll probably be pretty it'll different. It'll certainly than... create some excitement. <laughs> boring is reliable, boring is safe, yeah. boring is secure, boring yeah. is comfortable. I mean, Mark Zuckerberg once said, move fast, break stuff, and then he revised it to move fast and be 100% reliable. Right? <laughs> That's boring. Did right? he actually say that? He, I don't know. He shifted his narrative. Because that was the maverick, you know, early oh, days. Yeah, yeah. When he started running at 5.9, it's like, oh no, the ball game. Uh, actually, maybe it matters. <laughs> <laughs> Joe, great to have you on theCUBE. Thanks for sharing your awesome insight into the, the dynamics of the computing industry that's going cloud native, going KubeCon, uh, and, and certainly Kubernetes that you helped put together with the team, certainly taking on a life of its own. Um, last minute, take a minute to talk about Heptio, what you sure. guys are working on. Uh, get the plug-in. Yeah, so Heptio, uh, we have services support and training that we're offering to make customers successful with Kubernetes today. Uh, and uh, that's been invigorating really getting out there and talking with folks, seeing the problems that they're hitting now versus where we want it to go. We're doing a bunch of work around open source projects. We have uh, Heptio Arc, which is a backup disaster recovery project, open source. We have Sauna Boy, which uh, is a diagnostic uh, project for running the conformance tests, and it underpins the uh, Kubernetes conformance effort. We have Ksonet, which helps you configure applications. And then we also have uh, uh, Contour, which is an ingress controller building on top of Envoy, another CNCF project. Um, and then uh, into 2018, we're going to be offering more products and projects and services that really start targeting the uh, special needs of larger and larger enterprises. And that's where our focus is going to shift that's over awesome. time. And you guys are certainly helping customers who are under pressure to add more services. I mean, look at what Amazon's doing, more announcements. I mean, they're all little announcements, mostly some of them big, some little, but still, the cadence of new things happening 
is fast at all times right now. <laughs> I can't keep up either, <laughs> nobody else can. <laughs> we try, <laughs> two and a half hour keynotes, ridiculous. Joe Beta here inside theCUBE, co-founder, CTO of Heptio, hot startup, making Kubernetes interesting and, and exciting, and reliable and boring, not boring, I should say that, but oh, you know, infrastructure good. is good. <laughs> it's theCUBE, bringing, bringing you all the live action from Austin, Texas. I'm John Furrier, Stu Miniman, KubeCon and CloudNativeCon. We'll be right back after this short break.